Okay, so we are live. Uh, hello, everyone. We heartily welcome all our friends from around the world joining the Horace's Asia session. Uh, just give me a minute. Uh, some technical difficulties here. Okay. So hello everyone. We heartily welcome all our friends from around the world joining the Horace's Asia Summit. In today's new novel, across the countries, there are more polarized job markets with trends indicating there exists a growing pool of unemployed professionals who are in the real danger of losing value of their acquired skills. Worse, it will take them longer to secure new jobs and possibility of people getting trapped over time in low skill and low pay work. COVID has introduced a major disruption to the already, already polarized market. A whole range of service tasks are being eliminated by e-commerce, remote work, virtual presence, and the safe distancing and other new protocols. We are beginning to see the creative destruction of the products and services. And so the question is, how do we shape the world post COVID? I have an amazing set of panelists today here with me. We have Mr. Rajiv Ahuja. He's the president of StarTech India. We have Ms. Myra Andrea. She's a founder and chief executive officer of Sipta Graha Holdings in Indonesia. We will be joining soon by Mr. Rajiv Lutra, founder and managing director of Lutra and Lutra. And then we have Ms. Rhonda Paruti, who's president of the Empowering a Billion Women. And we will be soon joined by Yoshiki San, Yoshiki Sasaki San. He's a CEO of Japan Strategic Capital in Japan. And Mr. Abisha also joining us from New York. So while there are several ways of going about it, I shall address the two specific areas that may apply to all the industries. Firstly, the customer is the nucleus. You know, this has become more prominent and this has become more relevant in today's world. Because despite the changes occurring fast and furious across all domains, the customer will still be the nucleus of any digital transformation. And what is the reason? Well, because the customer is driving force of all transformation processes. It's not just the leadership team or what we see as a technological advancements or for that matter, the cultural changes or for that matter, the process improvements. These customers are driving force because they are already themselves very highly digitally transformed with information on their mobile, accessing reviews and peer feedback on what a product or service can look like, and they have easy access to a range of competitive options and opinions and ruthlessly comparing and contrasting with their competitors. And everything in their decision-making process is digitally transformed. So when, when they expect to be spoken in a certain way with a central, with a certain timeliness and a certain clarity, they expect to understand, select, compare, decide, and buy in an effortless manner. What's more, the literal expectations of your customer are not set by your competitors. They are set by the global examples of transformation, digital brands that rule the world, such as Amazon, Shopee, etc. All these brands have something in common, namely an almost obsessional fascination with and commitment to their customers, the serve. Every aspect of the buying experience is wrapped around the goals, the behaviors, and the context of the customers they are serving. To achieve this, you need to really transform as per your customer, who is going to continue to be the nucleus to your business. The second is making your employees future ready. We've had many conversations and many panel discussions, and we keep getting countless reviews about it. But let me say something which is nothing very out of extraordinary, but really what we should be looking at. So putting your employees at the center of your thinking and decision making 
will never steer you in the wrong direction. Having said that, investing in human capital to help them build the right skills and the attitude shall make them to a large extent recession proof. For your employees, it is not about the organization perks, but when they feel empowered to work autonomously and make decisions driven by core values, will the interest of your customers be really served well. Despite the COVID uncertainty, chaos and hardships, employers like us are taking steps to reinforce that their employees are the main priority and their livelihoods are well protected. As employees too, we have protected the livelihoods of our 1,500 employees during these difficult times. So we insisted on continuous upgrading with over 3,000 skills training programs for our staff to keep up with these times. These investments in human capital have been beneficial to our stakeholders and even given us a firm foundation to stand rock solid in the face of challenges like COVID-19 or many others that we may face in the future. The simple truth is challenges are inevitable. And while we simply don't know what the next challenge is going to be, and so it is always prudent to be prepared. Almost 18 years ago, the Global Schools Foundation had already embarked on both these principles that we just discussed, which is customer as a nucleus and making your employers future ready. I believe that these basic ideas are helping all of us build a community which is truly ready for the future. With that, I now request our colleague joining us from Gurgaon, India, Mr. Rajiv Ahuja, President of StarTech India. Over to you, Mr. Rajiv. Thank you, Atul. So uh, once again, my name is Rajiv Ahuja. I'm the president of uh, StarTech. Uh, we're an American company listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, full services, customer life cycle management company, having close to uh, 40,000 employees spread across 13 different countries. Uh, ranging from uh, Canada and Jamaica on the one side, going right up to the Philippines and Australia on the other end of the world. And uh, as we have fondly have a saying in the organization, the sun never sets on the uh, StarTech empire. So our entire business model till, uh, till the middle of March was built around our ability to get our employees into our brick and mortar centers uh, spread across the globe. And then somewhere between the middle of March and the end of March, a small little virus known as COVID arrived then became a household name across the world. That obviously has led to uh, reshaping the way we uh, approach uh, work today and, uh, and obviously is going to dictate what the future of work is going to look like. So while we were all locked down in the safety of our homes, Somewhere along the way, I think machines took to learning and, uh, and that, therefore the future of work moving forward is, uh, is going to be uh, a tango uh, between automation, AI and, uh, and the digital strategy or the digital footprint that organizations put together to serve uh, what Atul was just saying, uh, the ever-changing needs of the consumer uh, to serve the needs of uh, clients who are uh, who are adapting to these changing needs and also to serve the needs of the employees that make up the organization that's going to involve a lot of resizing the uh, the organization footprint in a creative manner where organizations will continue to expand their uh, their use of contingent workers to maintain more flexibility in the, the workforce uh, post covid-19 now, human capital has always been a very dominant factor in Asia. And, uh, and I think the future of work is going to involve organizations. Uh, it will require organizations to contemplate on how to balance their human and technological capital investments. The skill mis mismatches that have been caused today across organizations uh, because of this super uh, acceleration of digital transformation brings its own set of challenges. Maintaining a sense of belonging. How do you sustain uh, reskilling uh, programs? 
Uh, how do you enable innovation in a virtual model? Uh, and how will that help in upskilling or redeployment of talent continues to be uh, one of the big challenges that uh, that organizations like, uh, like us face. It is also transforming organization design and work design into a more it's forcing us to transform into a more simple and agile structure, uh, thereby moving away from the traditional multi-layered organizations uh, that, that typically existed. So essentially, I think the pandemic has managed to get uh, boardrooms to now commit to digital transformation. Prior to COVID, it was a nice to have. Post COVID, it has become a must have. And that is why you know we are seeing that uh, those companies that have uh, the blessings of the uh, of the management and uh, you know management teams that embrace the thought that digital and AI are here to power the future and meet the needs of an ever changing consumer, a consumer that's increasingly comfortable with operating off a device in the palm of his or her hand. They are the organizations that will be able to drive change from the top. And that means learning about the implications of digitization, machine learning, artificial intelligences. How does it, how will it at the end of the day impact the way we do business? How will it impact the way we, uh, uh, we, we skill our workforce so that we are able to be ready for the future? So, Atul, uh, two and a half, three minutes is what you had given me. And I just thought I'll hit up some broad uh, points that, uh, that are basically driving us and keeping us awake through the night. With that, I'll hand it back to you. Sure. Thank you, Rajiv. No, I think you have very, uh, very rightly said uh, the many parameters that are affecting us and uh, how we will be facing these. Uh, with that, may I now request Ms. Myra Andrea joining us from Jakarta, Indonesia, to be able to share her thoughts with us. You are on mute, Myra. Uh, Myra, you are on mute. Okay, clear. Thank you, Atul. Hello, everyone. My name is Myra, CEO of Graha Holding Consulting and Trading Company from Indonesia. Um, in our perspective regarding on the ship future for work post-COVID, as we know that pandemic made all change situation that global crisis of COVID-19 is sure to leave an everlasting impact on how people working moving forward. We are currently going through one of the most uh, significant changes for all business. Will change a new business will emerge. We are um, already seeing a shift different service and facing focus on acceleration of digital transformation uh, with the Great Leap platform. The Accelerate Technology Digital Transformation uh, trans Sorry, uh, Myra, you are on mute again. Okay. Okay. This is for Sorry. The Accelerate Technology Digital transformate, uh, Transforming Business can be option for um, shape work on future with safely. Um, example, virtual meeting or video conference, it may have used very effective way of community communicating for the employee or customer. Um, we have an example in Indonesia, the option other ship work also, we use um, robots can help um, for um, hospital. Um, in um, Indonesia, the challenge also one of technology robots um, that will become a point for the system in future. A work example on one of the hospital in few country, also Indonesia, has started using robots to solve patient uh, care. The robot can deliver food, medicine, and help for take a laboratory sample blood according to the time uh, specified for the patient. With the robot, obviously, it will reduce of work space for nurses. 
and it's very efficient um, and safe regarding on post COVID-19 with our certainty uh, situation. And of course, depending on the willingness of the organization or company budget, this is our perspective um, that I can uh, share um, uh, in, in regards to uh, post-COVID. And also, uh, we still have um, efficiency like Steve um, uh, office um, work extremely in, in Indonesia also. Very good. Uh, thank you, Myra. I think you did uh, mention about robots in hospitals, and yes, we are beginning to see them yes. uh, definitely reach out to other industries as well. And manufacturing is no, uh, you know, newcomer in that sector. Oh, with that, uh, maybe I will request uh, Miss Rhonda Paruti, who is joining us uh, from US, and uh, she's a founder and managing partner. Uh, she's a president of Empowering a Billion Women. So over to you, Rhonda. Thank you. Really, really happy to be here. So when I look at, you know, over the past year and all the changes that we've seen, I mean, digital transformation has been going on for a long time and a lot of people are reluctant to embrace it. And I think that that's the one thing that really came to the forefront with COVID is that quarantine. Somebody's got two devices, so if we can keep just one device logged in. Thank okay, you. Okay, you can carry on. Sorry about that, Rhonda. No problem. And so COVID obviously is, has brought that to the forefront. And when you look at, you know, technology companies, that's my background for the past 20 years, you know, companies like HP, you know, we were doing video conferencing and remote work, you know, 10, 12, 14 years ago. In fact, I spent 11 years at home um, and, and flying around the world. So, you know, having the ability and the freedom and the empowerment to be able to, you know, do what you do and do it well, wherever you are, you know, is, is something that I think that a lot of companies are now embracing. A lot of leaders here in the U.S. that I've spoken to have talked about how they didn't think they were going to be able to survive sending all their employees home and, you know, going fully virtual. And now I'm hearing from the, some of those same leaders thoughts of, you know, shutting down half of their, you know, commercial space because it's going, you know, better than expected. So I think that with all the tragedy and change and agility that we've seen this year, I think there's also a lot of positives and a lot of opportunities. And the one thing, you know, when you look at automation and change and just innovation over the past 100, 150 years, you see that you know people may be fearful but they embrace it and they always find the good and the positives and the inherently wonderful thing about being human is that we have the uh, ability to deduce and to assess risk and as we're building you know we can build ethically and we can use data to uh, build a tomorrow that's better for everyone you know, when you think about how bots and robots and the utilization of data can can predict and can actually, you know, save lives, I think that I think a lot of people um, are going to be uh, embracing that type of technology in the future. Very, very absolutely correct. And like you mentioned about HP, and I, I did a lot of years in IBM, and yes, uh, it's uh, it's the same technology, but. Uh, let's not forget that also these technologies that were in use in the past decade have actually come to us very handy during this difficult and challenging times. So yeah, absolutely, this is uh, this is great. And uh, thank you, Rhonda. And then we will move thank on you. to Yoshiki San. Uh, Yoshiki San Sasaki San is uh, Chief Executive Officer of Japan Strategic Capital from Japan. And uh, maybe have your comments, please. Sir, you are on mute. That's Hello, it. everybody. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm running a company in Japan uh, 
called Japan Strategy. Capital, which is doing sort of investment and the investment management uh, using funds. And uh, mostly my fund is to invest in agri-tech and agriculture business for the moment. And the uh, that company is under the umbrella company called uh, Social Impact Solutions, which we are aiming to do social impact businesses around the world. And one of our biggest uh, businesses is the healthcare service. Uh, especially we look at uh, the health of senior people, which is an uh, increasing trend uh, in the global world. And Japan is uh, the top runner at that point, where we have uh, more than 28% of the population is over 65. And the, also uh, we are uh, in the startup uh, incubator businesses, uh, which we believe uh, will bring innovations to society. So these two are our basic business. I have uh, personally been traveling almost half of the year, twice a month, to uh, different con- countries before COVID. And after March, there is no travel. But uh, what we, I have found is that if you have uh, your partner in each different countries, uh, you can do business there. And the key is that you can, whether, whether you can uh, commonly share your vision uh, to do uh, to realize that to the people there. And uh, at the same time, uh, if it is uh, one unit of the project is run by a few people who can uh, communicate like this, uh, then you can have a one-to-one dialogue each time you meet them. So if you have that mode of operation, I don't think there would be a, a lot of inconveniences in carrying out the business. Actually, my numbers of meetings are now almost two times the number before COVID. Before I had a, a traveling time in between the meetings, but these days, after one minute, I'm switching in a different meetings. So uh, that's, and also the time is becoming very flexible. You can use early morning, midnight, but midday you can walk around with your dog, for example. So you can uh, somehow design to optimize your uh, life, uh, how to spend your time, and uh, which in at the same time, increases your quality of life. So uh, if you think wisely, I think this is a very flexible world. Yes, of course, uh, face-to-face is meeting is very important to, uh, to be connected at the, uh, at the heart. <laughs> but if you are dealing with businesses and decision makings, uh, video meeting is Okay, even a telephone call is okay in doing that. So uh, I, I'm, we are. I'm now feeling that we are very uh, in an exciting age, so that you can increase your productivity and reach uh, if you have uh, your partners. So the creating partners is a, a very important thing. For example, we have uh, just hired uh, one Nigerian boy who studied in Japan as an intern. And then uh, I sent him back to uh, Nigeria so that he can start uh, creating our business there. So uh, that sort of thing, uh, probably it's, um, I mean, it's a matter of months or one, two year time, but if you are, I mean, in prepared to use that time to influence that person, I think uh, the business will go. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Yoshiki-san. That was, I think you have touched upon several points. We will come back to it. Uh, Let me quickly go over to our last speaker for the day. Uh, Mr. Abhi Shah is the vice chairman of the board of Morai Global Corporation. Over to you, Abhi. 
Thank you. Thank you. I think you got two devices. Um, I'm on one. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. If you have any other connected, you can disconnect that. Can you hear you me? Have okay? any other device? Okay, we can hear you now. Please go ahead. Um, sorry about that. So I'm glad that you can hear me clearly. Um, I'm an entrepreneur and uh, serve on various boards. Uh, as you mentioned, Mure Global Corporation, where I serve as vice chairman, is a digital transformation provider to Global 500. And on the board of advisors of uh, Sequoia Capital backed uh, artificial intelligence software as a service company. I also chair our not for profit, which uh, works on the ground in 40 cities in India. And we have transformed 1,500 municipal schools where 600,000 underprivileged children study. Uh, previously, I was founder and CEO of Clutch Group, which was an AI-powered data analytics and professional services firm. And it was an honor to be named EY Entrepreneur of the Year in 2015. Now, look, the grim reality is that we are up to 63 million COVID cases. Um, when I last checked, with 1.5 million deaths record unemployment and 10 trillion global bailouts so far and counting. Uh, so the sheer magnitude of the impact and the speed with which it has happened has truly exposed how fragile our organizations and economies really are and the need to build resiliency. And there is uncertainty about the variety of things in corporate boardrooms and the broader world today, but there's clarity on one thing. Uh, and as Rajiv mentioned, the future is digital. Um, you know, Atul, you started off talking about being client centric. Customers have increasingly uh, been buying digitally this year. Employees have switched to working remotely. And we may have leapfrogged five to seven years of digital adoption in this one year. There's a McKinsey survey that talks about how 75% of the people they polled said that even though they use digital channels for the first time this year, they will continue to do so in the future after the pandemic. So, you know, uh, to Rhonda's point, I mean, this is here to stay. Companies the size and scale of Tata Consultancy Services have announced that 450,000 of their employees globally 75% will move to remote working in five years. And led by Facebook, virtually every company out of Silicon Valley is, uh, you know, following suit on uh, making remote working permanent. So it's very clear that, you know, COVID has accelerated the technology trends that were already underway in terms of AI and automation. And, uh, you know, in the next two, three, four decades, depending on whose uh, prediction you believe, uh, virtually 50% of the jobs today are projected to get automated. Now, that's a pretty big number and the lower to mid skill people will get impacted the most. But I agree with, you know, what Rhonda said that, you know, we've had labor saving automation for 200 years. And uh, we've still ended up with more jobs and lower unemployment over the past two centuries. So I think the gloom and doom is because it's easy to predict which jobs are going to be lost. It's much harder to predict what new jobs are going to be created. And, and hindsight obviously makes it easier. Uh, and so, you know, I'm, I'm more optimistic about the tectonic shifts or changes that we are experiencing. And I, for one, believe that we are not going back to normal as we knew it. I think uh, we are moving forward into a new normal next year, um, you know, in a brave new digital world. And the future of work uh, is going to have leaner organizations. It's going to have a uh, rising contingency workforce, as Rajiv alluded to, and the gig economy. Um, you know, and, and the gig economy and the contingent workforces may go as high up as 50 percent of overall in next seven years. You know, there are reports and projections around that. So reskilling and upskilling becomes critically important to meet the newer demands and the newer jobs that are created. And look, um, you know, this is going to be very difficult to do because 
half of the world today as we sit here is still not online and majority of those people live in developing countries four out of five people in the developing countries are not yet uh, online so this you know change is not going to be easy and there are going to be new challenges on how you really engage uh, and align a workforce that is so diverse between your employees and your contingent workforce and so uh, dispelled throughout the globe you know given remote working will break down the barriers of having to physically go in so it's um, it's it's truly a brave new world and um, you know i think we are going to move forward into a new normal and a new future of work as we move forward thank you abhi uh, that was a very very clearly put out statement and uh, some of these things for example when we have been talking to some governments actually this situation is creating a new challenge for the governments they are more concerned about the increasing remote remote uh, working or virtual working that we talk about they are they are also concerned about the fact that the composition of workforce not just a gig part but even the nationality composition of workforce may change over a period of time and so could lead to potentially unseen you know trends in uh, unemployment that we've never seen before so there are major challenges ahead but let me go back to the discussion and we've got another 15 minutes uh maybe let me start uh, while i await the questions from our par- from our audiences uh, who have been very patient in listening to us uh maybe let me start with rajiv so rajiv in terms of your experience you know given the profile of customers that you've been handling uh where do you see what challenges do you see they will likely most likely have over the next you know 3 to 5 years and what what could be those hot button issues where you think you can really help those customers yeah atul that's a great question and uh, i think that's still a work in progress uh, i've maintained this for quite some time that uh, there are two broad parts to covid one of which i think has been discussed in a uh, great detail across uh, an, you know a number of platforms which is the anatomy behind uh, covid uh, you know what is the virus all about how is it affected in our lives and stuff like that i think there is another part which is still unfolding as we speak and that is to do with the psychology behind covid and by psychology uh, i'm giving it uh, three dimensions the psychology of the uh, the employees the psychology of organizations and the psychology of uh, consumer behavior so uh, you know i'll i'll go back to i'll start with consumer behavior i think uh, consumer behavior patterns spending patterns are changing you uh, alluded to the amazons of the world and how e-commerce was seeing a tectonic shift uh, well that's one great example with uh, brick and mortar retail outlets yet to be fired up social distancing norms still in place uh, increased uh, awareness regarding health and safety issues people are taking to ordering online now so all of a sudden demand is picking up in sectors which one always knew would a growth sector but the pace at which that adoption is now taking place i think has caught uh, you know the number of people on the service side uh, you know uh, off guard and uh, what it's going to require at an organization end i think is the fact that all of us as leaders have to become digital guides who educate employees across the organization on digital skills because don't forget digital transformation is a mindset it's not a it's not a it's not a cutting edge technology by itself and at the heart of this overhaul is the third dimension which is people i have always been a firm advocate of i've kept my mantra in the organization my thesis is very simple it's happy people happy customers lead to happy shareholders so you know as long as we can stay focused on these two three things i think we'll be better prepared to receive whatever the future has to offer yeah thank you rajiv i think you rightfully said the happy customers and happy employees lead to happy stakeholders and that's a very very 
interesting statement. Uh, over to uh, next uh, to Myra. And, uh, you know, you mentioned about the examples of robots which we have seen in healthcare and hospitality. And they have been a, a steady place in the area of uh, automation in Japan factories and many other production lines. Are there any new sectors or new industries or new applications where you feel that robots may be actually helping the society and the community as such? Um, in the, Indonesia, they use utilize for um, the first um, the first example for hospital, but um, the other option for shopping also in a few countries uh, we can uh, see that. Um, other show, um, robots can play a role in safe shopping. So uh, it's like um, a retinal harness, digital technology, um, to shape the next generation, the, the next generation of shopping experience for retailer who can only use, utilize a fraction of their large uh, store space because of social distance and maximizing revenue is a major business and creative challenge. So it means rethinking uh, the process of innovation and also how the fund and the budget are assigned to the department. And for that, another uh, social distance uh, in, other in our country, just example for a uh, hospital for their robots. That's mean because uh, the, uh, the government uh, just um, wants to make it safely for the patient so like uh, only one floor they provide for the robots for stuff or medicine or laboratory or that starting um, uh, for reduce of the um, distance with the nurse uh, and work work with right now yeah i think uh you you know you mentioned very interestingly retail and i think that's where the consumer behavior that raji mentioned comes in very importantly whether retail behavior patterns uh, will help uh, help us increase the adoption of robots and the automation in that sector but i know i recently visited uh, to buy during the lockdown i went to buy a bicycle and i went to this decathlon and every checkout everything is automated there i mean there is no person serving you on any particular product lines except for your inquiries or whatever. So yeah, I mean, that, that is an experience. Uh, so Rhonda, in terms of, you know, the looking forward in the next three to five years, do you see any specific innovations that will dominate our daily lives and particularly the consumers? And how do you see this playing out? Like video conferencing has been the in thing today, uh, which has helped us keep connected with everyone. Like that, do you see any other, you know, kind of a technology that will become a very major component of our lives? So I think that, I think we'll see some of the same technologies, but we'll see them expedite, especially surrounding data and how we use it, right? There's a new term, you know, that's floating around the internet of behavior, right? Like the internet of things. I think that when you look at data and how all of the different you know, uh, attributes of data can be utilized uh, in, in almost any industry. You're gonna be able to innovate in ways, you know, much like communication, right? You wanna communicate to your audience and you wanna know who your audience is. Well, the internet of behavior would mean that you know who I am and you know what, you know it to serve to me when I want it without me having to ask you. So I think when you look at all of the opportunities that data presents, and I think that that is really where I see the most uh, innovation happening uh, quickly. Okay. Uh, Yoshiki san you also mentioned about social impact solutions and uh, the fact that uh, you have you know, very strong interest in startups. Uh, do you see any particular segment of startups which could be, you know, new interest areas for you where you currently, you're looking at, you know, like strong investments going in that area? Uh, yes, uh, I have been in investment uh, business for more than 30 years. 
And the, when you look at the investment, you look at industries where you have a prospect toward the future. And the, these days, uh, the interest of the people looks go- going into healthcare sector for the moment, uh, partly because of the COVID situation. And the, when you look at the variations, they are uh, very highly valued at the moment. Uh, a somewhat bubble level, I think. And the, uh, so now, mostly the global uh, economy, I mean, people are wealthy enough for rich people and they can afford anything. But uh, probably the question coming from now is how to propagate this benefit to the weaker people, people in the developing world, and also people uh, at a very I mean, senior stage, for example, and how to uh, provide services for these people. You uh, really become deteriorated. Uh, at the last eight to ten years of your life, for example. But to maintain your QOL is very important and uh, mostly uh, discarded in many countries. Uh, also, you need to look at uh, children without proper education, for example. So, uh, probably uh, what we need to see is that uh, what uh, we can provide for super rich people, uh, but rather than look at uh, weaker people, and that makes the uh, world uh, happier uh, as a total. I mean, so uh, therefore, uh, the IT uh, startups, for example, who can create a platform to create that sort of benefit. Uh, is uh, socially needed. At the same time, if socially needed, that creates some commercial results anyway. So uh, we are, for example, uh, starting uh, e-learning system in Indonesia, for example. <laughs> All the engineers are in Makassar, uh, not in Jakarta, but uh, that is uh, meant for education for medical people, starting from there. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of opportunities if you look at from that perspective. Uh, for example, drone de- delivery of uh, important things which we, we don't have uh, road and also the uh, unserved, uh, create uh, medicines for unserved areas is another thing. And the... So Yoshiki-san, uh, yeah. I think we have just a, a minute left. We need okay. to cover Abhi. So sorry about that. Uh, yeah, over sorry. To Abhi. Abhi, would you like to just add uh, comments? In yeah. The of- in the interest of time, Uh, I think a lot has already been covered. We have less than 50 seconds. So I will just leave um, all of our participants this morning with a closing comment that comes to mind, hearing to everyone what Charles Darwin said, right? That it is not the strongest of the species that survives uh, and it is not the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is most adaptable to change uh, that survives. Uh, so with that, um, you know, really enjoyed the conversation with uh, all of you. Uh, and Atul, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Rajiv, Myra, Abhi, Rhonda, and Yushiki san. It's been a great conversation. Uh, we hope to be connected. And uh, at some point in time, again, we'll exchange thoughts on this. But uh, thank you so much uh, for joining from all different time zones. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.